If you've ever heard that ancient people or even medieval or renaissance era people memorized entire books word for word that they could recite without anything but their minds, you might have wondered, hey, can I do that? And the answer is, it depends. You see, we're talking about different things when we talk about full book memorization. Take, for example, memorizing the Odyssey and walking around and being able to sit down on a corner and start to tell that whole story from beginning to end from your memory. Now, certain people have done some research into this. The Singer of Tales is an interesting book where Alfred Lord presents his research that he helped someone named Milman Perry conduct and they tried to figure this out. Did people really recite Homer from memory? And in order to do this, they couldn't go in a time machine back to ancient Greek, but they could go to Yugoslavia and they found a bunch of people who would sing like troubadours entire narratives from their memory with an instrument. <laughs> And what they found is really, really interesting. They found that it's very unlikely that they were ever memorizing anything. If anything, what they were doing was memorizing formulas, but even the idea that they were memorizing formulas is not that clear. So The Singer of Tales is a really interesting book to read, and I would think that we could take this discussion that they have about the difference between memorizing formulas and just absorbing formulas that enable you to iterate lots and lots of narrative material in the context of jazz. So for example, in jazz, there's a difference between memorizing chord tones, for example, and memorizing arpeggios, and just having knowledge that has been deeply absorbed about those principles, so that if you're in a 2-5-1 or something like this that you're playing in a jazz standard, you're able to just iterate. You're able to be productive. And it's not really that clear that it comes from having memorized any of that material. It comes from a deep absorption of the knowledge and the practice of iteration. So these people who were able to recite epic poetry from memory, they were not actually reciting verbatim. And the formulas that they were using were productive of innovative variations. It was always different, everything that they were doing. And they have many, many recordings of these performances, Milton Perry and Alfred Lord, and not only do they have recordings, but they have interviews with these people that you can read in The Singer of Tales. So the point is, is that at some point, Homer's Odyssey was written down, but before it was written down and codified, it was actually probably most likely produced in many, many variations by a deep knowledge of how narrative works, as opposed to some sort of knowledge of memorized word-for-word -word phrases. You know, like how the Iliad opens up a particular translation that I really love is, Of Peleus, son Achilles, sing, O muse, the vengeance deep and deadly, whence to Greece unnumbered ills arose. Now, I memorized that word-for-word -word because I love it, it sounds really great, but it doesn't help me have any knowledge of how the story of the Iliad works. Whereas what would help me have knowledge of how the story works that could help me just randomly sort of speak out a version of the story if I wanted to was knowing about the hero's journey. Knowing about the difference between, for example, a unconscious need and a conscious desire. And what that means is that Achilles has a conscious desire, but he also has an unconscious need. And a huge part of how the story works out is him being able to resolve those tensions. And many, many characters have this tension. And when you have that knowledge of how story structure works, it's the equivalent of being able to solo over a chord progression in music. Now, I've mentioned Iliad and Odyssey, but let's have a look at another example, this time the Bible, and we'll think about it in two ways, starting with what Bart Ehrman has had to say about this idea of oral transmission and riffing and variations on a theme. Here's what happened historically. People who developed writing realized that you can check sources. In an oral culture, you can't check a source. All you can do is hear it again. Then you've got to remember how you heard it the first time, but you've got to remember it because there's nothing to check. In written cultures, they develop ways of checking, and so we develop the idea that things ought to be the same. There ought to be consistency. That's, that's a concern in written cultures, but it's not a concern in oral cultures. So when the, gospels, when the gospel stories, the stories about Jesus were being circulated by word of mouth, they simply didn't have this concern. That's why you have all these differences. Now, with Ehrman's point in mind, when it comes to the stories of people in the medieval and the Renaissance areas, 
Well, first of all, we can look to music as a very, very interesting example before we get into literature, because I think it tells us something very, very important. In Medieval Music and the Art of Memory, Anna Berger talks about how it may have been possible for people in that era to memorize up to 75 or more hours of music, which she points out would be the equivalent of Beethoven's major works and all of Wagner, which is a ton of music. But here again, there's a difference between understanding and then the actual rote memorization of text, but here's text plus the actual way that sounds are supposed to be distributed along a scale. And one thing that leaps out at me about this is that it was usually the people in charge of the choir who were the most skilled at this. They would have had the most repetition, I'm guessing, because they not only had to learn it themselves, both the theory of music and all of the words and everything related to the performance and so forth to be able to teach it, but then they would have had all the repetition of teaching it. So I think that this is very much a revelation. If you really want to know something deeply, you've got to teach it. You've got to not only be the student of it, but you have to be someone who goes further. Take it to the Yugoslavian singers or the people who we have to guess may have been reciting Homer's Odyssey. They would have had learning experiences, learning those formulas, seeing it performed by others. Then they would have had ruminating about it themselves, thinking about it themselves. And then they would have had performing it, but they also would have had feedback from the people to whom they were performing. So I think this is a really interesting thing to keep in mind because we are now in a different culture. We're in a culture that has a lot of alone time. It has a lot of me, you, and the screen time, which is essentially just you and a screen time. But there isn't this discourse. There isn't an oral culture. A lot of people think that the internet is taking us back to an oral culture. I don't think that that's exactly what's happening. I think what's happening is we're having a screen culture, which is new and unusual. It has elements of oral culture, but the extent to which that you're actually getting feedback is not so clear. If anything, you are giving feedback to algorithms that are studying you and then giving you more information that causes you to give them more feedback. And it doesn't really have that much to do with you either ruminating over what you're consuming or actually producing what you're consuming. It is you producing behaviors as you do whatever it is that you do, which I don't think the algorithms can fully understand. Although who knows what's going to happen. The point being is that if you want a shot at being able to remember vast amounts of information, you want to pay attention to this much broader feedback loop that oral cultures had. Now, when it comes to the medieval period and textual memorization, let's say knowing all of the laws like Peter of Ravenna was said to have done and who wrote about his accomplishments in a book called The Phoenix, I think we need to keep all of this in mind because it's said that he knew all of medieval canonical law and had it at the fingertips of his tongue, so to speak, and could just recite anything that came from those medieval law books. And the question is, really? Did he really have that? I mean, if you look at the Phoenix, he describes memory techniques that are the very same memory techniques that we use today in terms of a memory palace. And certainly they would help a person create a lot of recall and have recall that was close to verbatim, if not verbatim, if they wanted, but all of medieval law. One of the things that comes to my mind here is similar to something that we see in the Bible. So for example, in the Bible, this or that person is said to have lived for 500 years. Well, this is a device. It's a device that helps us see that people are more important. We feel that metaphorically, and it is something that, you know, is not necessarily true in the same way that Achilles may have had some of his abilities exaggerated to make us understand the powers of a god, right? To have more importance imbued upon them. So when we hear that certain medieval or Renaissance people were reciting books forward and backwards, part of those reports may be a metaphor that's to help us understand just how good their skills were, but not necessarily truthfully giving us a description of what actually happened. Now, another way to look at this notion of exaggerated importance is to read The Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci by Jonathan D. Spence. No shade to Ricci. I love the guy. I admire his writing about memory so much. I went to visit his grave in Beijing and I just, you know, bask in his influence and am so inspired. But I think there are some clues in how that Spence relates his story. And here's what happened. 
he went to Beijing and he recited from memory books forward and backwards, or so the legend goes. But he was always stopped by the Chinese memory masters who would say, oh yes, well, we can do that too. And then they would proceed to do their own memory recitation. Now, what am I getting at here? I'm getting at the stopping, because who wants to listen to an entire book recited forward, let alone backward? We want to maybe listen to stories recited, but backwards? I mean, who's actually tracking this? That somebody got a little ledger and they're, oh yeah, they could do that. And for how long is it necessary to do that? Even in the contemporary world, if someone says that they've memorized 100,000 digits of pi, nobody listens to the recitation forward, let alone backward. What they do is they pick certain segments and they say, okay, here's a sequence with two, seven, one, eight. What comes before it and after it? And they test this maybe for two hours, but they sure as heck don't listen to all 100,000 digits. And I doubt that the people in those periods did either. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But in the storytelling that they passed down and that maybe Jonathan Spence didn't pick up on is that these stories give them this exaggerated importance in order for us to give them more importance. Because if we aren't given some sort of metaphorical label or symbol that helps us realize how important a person is, we might not take on that importance. And this is part of rhetoric. It's part of how that we persuade each other. Now, to be clear, I am not casting doubt on the notion that anybody can memorize an entire book from beginning to end and recite it backwards. In fact, I've memorized very long texts and I can recite them backwards if I want. The real thing that I'm trying to get at here is the stopping of the demonstration. This to me seems to be so pivotal to our understanding that we don't even need to memorize entire books. And the extent to which anybody ever tested these things by listening to people memorize an entire book backwards is to me a bit suspicious. It's a bit suspect. So what ultimately is the point of memorizing anything verbatim in the first place? Well, number one, I think it should be for your personal fulfillment, never for showing off. You know, I often give demonstrations of my Sanskrit. I cut myself off because I can tell that people's eyes start to glaze over. I can go on and on and on and on and on. You know, it's like, do you really want to listen to this whole thing, even though I can do it? It doesn't even matter if you want to or not, because I did it for me, right? And it's only for me and my progress. It's for my understanding. Now, if we get together with a bunch of people who love Sanskrit and they say, hey, we'd love to hear your voice singing this out, then great. But the real magic comes from knowing what the Sanskrit means and then being able to communicate it in an iterative way, to be able to innovate on it, to riff on it. The second thing I would suggest is that if you're interested in working on full book memorization, get involved with just studying other people who have done it, ideally people who are alive. So for example, Mike McKinley has been on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, and we talked together about how that he memorized 66 Psalms, which is now more than that amount. And you know, he interpreted the way that I teach memory techniques to do his own thing, which is ultimately what I'm trying to teach you to do anyway, is to make the techniques your own. And so having more insight into how different people have accomplished vast volumes of memorization is really, really important. For myself, I just take it one word at a time, which is a major tip for you. Get a memory palace going. Don't wait for it to be perfect. Just get one going and then put one word on one station. In the beginning, that's all you have to do. When I first was memorizing things like the opening passage of the Iliad of Peleus' son Achilles, it's just an image of a garbage pail with Brad Pitt kicking it. And I got a couple of words out of that, right? Because Brad Pitt plays Achilles in a particular movie, I think it was called Troy, if memory serves, and he's kicking a pail, right? And so that gives me that Peleus of Peleus' son Achilles. Sing O Muse, The Vengeance Deep and Deadly. Now, the fridge was over here, but now a little bit further along, we just had a doorway, and in that doorway was the Statue of Liberty. Uh, sing O Muse. This is just a perfect image for that. The Vengeance Deep and Deadly. Well, she's digging deep and she's very angry and the shovel is shaped like a V, right? So, up his son Achilles, sing O Muse, the Vengeance Deep and Deadly. Whence to Greece unnumbered ills arose. My image there, I just turned a corner in this memory palace and then on the wall I had a map of Greece and then beyond that there's this chalkboard there and I just saw myself wiping away a zero. 
unnumbered ills. The wiping away reminded me of this word, unnumbered. Kind of like a weird way of putting it, but that's the image that came to mind and it was perfect. But I just worked word for word. Think of it like stringing beads. You just put one bead on a string. The string is your memory palace and then your magnetic imagery, your associations, is each and every word. And you're just putting it in the place that it needs to be fired off. And then whatever you want to keep in long-term memory, well, you revisit again and again and again. Actually use what you've memorized. And if you're not going to use it, then try to think about how you can turn it into knowledge. How you could make it like something that you could perform and just be honest. Say, you know, I don't remember it word for word, but there's a wonderful poem or there's a wonderful story and it goes a little bit like this. And just allow the, the crystallized remains of that material to guide you. And there's a wonderful little article about a pastor named Andy Davis who memorized 42 books of the Bible in this way. And the article is great because it talks about how he has allowed what he's memorized to transform into knowledge so that it's not verbatim recall that he has of the text, but rather it's this deep residual knowledge that allows him to focus on the wisdom in the text as he perceives it as part of teaching. So in other words, he's able to perform it and get feedback on that performance. And just imagine how rewarding it is if others also are very familiar with those texts and they could say, you know, the actual word there in Hebrew is X. And then you have a wonderful discussion. You're able to have new knowledge produced by the opportunity created by being authentic about what you've learned and memorized, whether it was the entire book or not. So. Did ancient people memorize entire texts? Well, it's not entirely clear. I don't think we'll ever get an answer. I don't doubt that it's possible because I've been able to memorize lots and lots of texts and I can memorize more and more as life goes on. Anything that I want to maintain verbatim, I will need to take effort that maintains it verbatim. But one thing that's so magical about it is how much transforms into that residual knowledge that you can't get otherwise. You can't even taste the wine of it unless that you have memorized it verbatim in order to contemplate it deeply, to speak with others about it deeply, to get their feedback from it on that basis of deep, deep, deep knowledge. So what do you think? Are you interested in memorizing just parts of books or do you want entire books? And if so, what are the books that you want in entirety and why them as opposed to others? For me, the one that I've started most recently, which is now my fifth text that I'm working on, and these are short books, but they're still very rewarding ones, is called The Atma Bodha and it is by Adi Shankaracharya and it is so fulfilling. I've only memorized the first verse so far, but I can't wait to get deeper and deeper into the text. I've read it in English before and now I'm memorizing it in Sanskrit and it is so rewarding even if it's just a short text and I learn more and more about a particular philosophy that I've studied now for years and I learn it precisely because I make these deep connections through memorizing it in the original language. So I can't wait to hear from you and I hope you've enjoyed these thoughts about entire book memorization, what it means, how it may have been done, and what I think it really suggests to us about the human condition.